original super fun and all about artisan cheese and more to melt your peaceful heart and toast your peaceful life. Coming to you from the Appalachian Mountains of southwestern Virginia, this is the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hey, this is Scott Hall from Peaceful Heart Farm, and you are listening to the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Hello, everybody. Melanie Hall here. I hope you're doing very, very well. And the conversation today and every day revolves around the value of tradition, traditional homestead living, traditional raw milk products, and artisan cheese. Topics discussed here are designed to create new perspectives and possibilities for how you might add the taste of tradition to your life. Today, I'll follow up on the basics of getting started with gardening with an intro to seed starting indoors ahead of planting in the garden when the weather turns warm. But before we get to that, more homestead updates are in order. I'll be talking about our beautiful livestock guardian dogs for the most part. Uh, There is so much to share about these fantastic dogs. But I want to take a minute and say welcome to all the new listeners. And welcome back to the veteran homestead loving regulars who stop by the Farmcast for every episode. Thank you so much for hanging in there with me. I appreciate you all so much. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, on to homestead updates. I have a bit of cow news. Maybe I'll get to that at the end. Maybe not. Anyway, let's talk about the dogs. Uh, Let's see. We have added two new wonderful dogs to our homestead. We already had Mac. I'll talk about him a little bit later. But we added uh, two more. And I can't tell you how ecstatic I am about these little beasties. Finnegan, Finn for short, and Charlotte. We purchased them from a fellow vendor at the farmer's market uh, who is scaling down and exiting their business. So these guys were guarding chickens and turkeys. And we don't have these kinds of birds yet, but we will at some point. So it's nice to know that we have dogs that have at least some experience with poultry. It can be hard for livestock guardian dogs to learn how to guard and not chase and chew on poultry. They love to chase them. Uh, so Finn is, he's half Great Pyrenees and half Anatolian Shepherd. He's a big baby. He loves to have his tummy rubbed, follows us everywhere. And we've had these guys since mid-October. So they're still learning about us and the sheep. It is the first week of February as I record this. So we have had them three and a half months, I think, at this point. And right now they are kept exclusively with the sheep. Uh, and at first we had to hold Finn in a fenced area next to the sheep because he was chasing them all over the place. Now he's proven since that he can be trusted to not run them to death and he now resides with them and Charlotte. And I've not seen much evidence that the dogs have bonded with the sheep and that will come in time. But right now they're learning to love us and we definitely love them. Charlotte is a great Pyrenees. She is the most beautiful dog I've ever seen. Well, maybe I'm biased. (laughs) Anyway, for whatever reason, she is very shy of humans. And at first, I thought she'd been mistreated. Lately, though, I'm thinking she was not socialized to humans at an early age. Uh, She just has an innate mistrust of humans. I mean, she could have been abused. Anyway, she's not aggressive or anything. It's just that we cannot walk up to her and pet her. Uh, But we're getting there. The first time that I was able to pet her was when the vet was here a few weeks ago for like a general exam and some heartworm tests. And while the vet was working on Finn, Charlotte came over next to me and was kind of hiding behind me. And I was able to pet her and hug her. But alas, it was only for the moment when she thought she needed protection. And Finn was not only unavailable, but hey, he may have needed some protection himself, you know, in her mind. So from the beginning, she would come up and quickly take a biscuit from my hand as long as I had Finn in between us. I would reach over his back and she would take the biscuit and run off to chomp on it. Then a few days ago, she started coming up without Finn between us. And she still would grab the biscuit and run off. And I still can't just walk up to her, but she was she's improved greatly in just a few months. Yesterday, I was able to pet her and give her some love. 
She's tied on a lead at the moment, and that allowed me to walk up to her fairly easily. It's uh, so satisfying to finally be able to love on her. For weeks and weeks, she held back and just watched Finn get petted and babied and loved and looked like she wanted some too, but she wasn't willing to come up to us. So now she's finally getting some of that. She is scheduled to be spayed next week. We don't like having her tied up, but she has escaped twice in the past couple of weeks. Uh, She's in heat. And the Great Pyrenees breed, just in general, is harder to contain than goats. Who knew? Well, I knew there was an issue with roaming with this breed. I knew about that. However, I had no idea they were so successful as escape artists. We have been so concerned that she will escape and get pregnant, but and so I'll be glad when this escape artist is safe from pregnancy. That's happening Wednesday, which is four or five days from now. Now, let me talk a little bit more about Finn. That's uh, short for Finnegan. I don't know if I said that already, but Finn is such a sweetie. As, as long as you're not the veterinarian, boy, he does not like the vet. Yesterday, she was here and he showed her his teeth and just growled relentlessly. I mean, he had almost a wolf look on his face. Even with me standing there assuring him it was okay, he was in full protect mode. But she's a brave vet and also quite familiar with working with livestock guardian dogs that are aggressive And we were able to get their vaccines done without much incident. I just had to be very careful to have him contained and tied. I had him tied up pretty short before she approached. And then a quick stick in the rear and it was done. And then out the gate she went again. So normally we can introduce him to new people and he's fine with them. I have had no problem except with the vet. He remembers. He remembers. And and all she did was put the... uh, stethoscope up on his chest and he just went nuts so for some reason anyway trusting him with someone new without us being very close is never allowed but he's he's usually pretty good with new people and he's very protective of us he's such a big baby when he's interacting with us and he loves to lay down on the ground belly up begging for a rub brushing and combing him is also something he enjoys So we love both of these animals, but uh, they've been causing us grief when they escape. I mentioned Charlotte escaping. She is the leader in that regard. Once she makes it out, she's shown him the way. And for the most part, then he's the leader once they're in or out. She shows them how to get out. Uh, And then she's created that escape path. And then he'll lead after that. The first time they escaped, she returned home sometime overnight she was just there in another pasture the next morning finn we didn't find uh until late in the afternoon he was about five or six miles away and he was hanging out around a local farmer's barn after a few hours the farmer kind of ventured close enough to read his collar we have a large yellow tag on all of our dogs that has our farm name and phone number plainly displayed because hey they might get away and we, I bet it was only less than a week that we had those collars on them, so that really came in handy. So Finn allowed him close, and he got our, the guy got our phone number, and I was so relieved to get that call. Finn was missing nearly 24 hours. Uh, we had Facebook messages posted to our friends. We, the lo- local radio station also broadcast it. And we know this because the second time they escaped last week, another local farmer, only a quarter mile away this time, remembered hearing it on the radio and gave us a call like, hey, aren't you missing a dog? And they were only gone for a couple of hours that time. I mean, I don't even know if the radio station had a chance to announce it. He was remembering from the previous time. Anyway, Scott walked him home on a leash. Unfortunately uh, for Charlotte, we were done with worrying ourselves over them. She's secured until her surgery next week. Now, we do have another dog, Mac. I've talked about him before. He is now comfortably bonded with the cows and the calves. We started him with the sheep, but he also chased them. Mac is just over two years old and still exhibits puppy behavior from time to time. And as we knew the other two dogs were coming, we decided to try and get him bonded with the cows and save the intense sheep training for the older dogs, Finn and Charlotte. He will eventually get trained to the sheep. Uh, But right now it's cows. And he was fairly easy to acclimate with our cows. We started with a few calves from this year. And then we added the yearlings from last year. And once he got comfortable with all of them, we added the three new heifers that I talked about in the last podcast that we just uh, brought back from Wisconsin. 
And then finally, all of the big girls were added to the mix. So he's very comfortable. All of the cows are together in one herd, which is a great thing. And he's very comfortable with his new charges. And he takes his responsibilities quite seriously. When we are looking for him, we simply find out where the car, cows are hanging out. And he is sure to be close by. Uh, Mac is also a sweetheart and also a loner. He's very comfortable on his own. Where Finn and Charlotte want more attention, he's fine with seeing us once a day with his food and some petting. He, he was born and raised with sheep his sheep that he didn't chase around and is used to being completely on his own. So the, uh, the only real issue we have with him is his coat mats so easily. The other two dogs, you don't even hardly have to brush them and they just stay clean. And, but at this point, Mac is matted all over and will likely need some serious trimming in the spring. Um, after consulting with the vet, looks like he he will likely get a spring trim every year. We can comb him out regularly, but he is still going to get mats that will need to be cut out. It's just the nature of his coat. That fine undercoat, it, it's very similar to that of our cashmere boat goats. It's just so fine. You can roll it between your fingers and it just instantly mats up. And we love him very much and he's definitely worth this extra effort. So let's talk about the sheep that the dogs are all here to, to guard. And Mac will eventually get with the sheep too. He was raised with sheep originally. He just is not familiar with these sheep as being his sheep to take care of. So uh, I know I'm, I mentioned the dogs are being, Finn and Charlotte are in with the sheep. But did I mention in a previous co podcast that we had replaced some of our sheep? I can't remember. I mean, we lost like, I don't know. Three, three fourths, five eighths. No, no, not, that's more, I don't. I've got my fractions wrong. We had twenty one sheep and ended up with uh, three or four. I guess we lost eighty to ninety percent of our sheep. Anyway, um, we have new sheep and they're registered stock from a local farmer, and we now have five breeding ewes uh, and one breeding ram and a weather that will go to market soon. Uh, weather is a uh, castrated sheep. And so uh, he'll be leaving pretty soon. But between the one, or actually we had two ewes that were left. And so we got three new ewes and a new ram. So we have five ewes, one ram, and one meat sheep that's going to market. Now, when Finn and Charlotte first arrived, they were both in a separate pen right next to the sheep. We're trying to get them, uh, uh, trying to get them acclimated to the sheep and the new sheep the the three ewes and the ram had been raised around dogs and so they would lay down just outside the fence where the dogs were inside so after a while then we put the dogs in with the sheep and all of that changed changed because finn chased them and then the veterans who had already been chased multiple times by stray dogs they showed the new girls and the guy how to hide in the woods and even after putting Finn back in the separate pen, they pretty much kept their distance from the dogs. So that was actually a small step backward that all of a sudden even the new ones were afraid of the dogs. So in an attempt to get the dogs to attach to the sheep, what we did, and, and also we needed to get the sheep to overcome their fear of the dogs, we began feeding the sheep a little treat each evening. Usually they only get that right before they birth, but we were also we're using it now just to... Uh, get them used to get the dogs and the sheep used to each other. And this seemed to work. Number one, Finn saw that we care for them. And so he doesn't chase them anymore. We feed them just like we feed him. So we would go out and feed them and then we would feed the dogs. Now the sheep were still very standoffish at first and they would watch every move that Finn made. In the evening we let him loose in the field and we would supervise him either on a leash or let him run freely and watch him closely. Um, and after a few times of getting their special treats, the sheep really no longer wearily have watched Finn's every move. In fact, they come right up to where he is to get their food. They're jostling around with each other, trying to get their head in the feed trough and pushing each other around. And we're feeding both the dogs and the sheep within a few feet of each other. So the sheep have now become so friendly that we actually touch them a little bit while they eat. Uh, once they're done eating, they still go back to the woods, but they're calm about it. And they don't stand up with their ears pricked forward listening for the evil beastie. Uh, they will calmly lay down and, and chew their cud. 
So after a while, we put them all together. So they are all together now. Uh, and during the day, I can see both of the dogs sleeping in the field and the sheep kind of wandering around and grazing. And the day I'm looking for is the one where the sheep let the dogs lay down next to them. I plan on keeping them close where I can watch everything until well after the lambs are born in the spring, which, by the way, is going to be probably four to five weeks, six weeks at the most. We should start having lambs. And that may be a great challenge for the dogs. New lambs, there's blood, afterbirth, and so on. And hopefully they will see the new lambs need to be protected and not eaten. That's a worry for another day. God gives us each day in its turn. And right now we are happy with how things are progressing. Now let me talk about the creamery. I cannot tell you how many hours and hours of work Scott has put in on material lists. Prices for construction materials are skyrocketing, so we are trying to buy all the materials that we need now, though it may be months before they're used or installed. Ceiling panels for the milking parlor, they're the same material that we used on the roof last fall, I think, late, late I guess it was spring and early summer that we did the roof. Uh, quotes showed now double the price. Now, Scott did get a price break and got it down to perhaps one and a half times the price he paid last year. And that material has been delivered. But that's just an example of how the prices have gone up. He's had meetings with the power company and the propane gas representatives. That All of that's been accomplished. Orders are placed for the materials that they need. The, uh, and the electrical wiring and conduit, all the little bits and pieces for that project have been ordered. Although I believe Scott is still chasing down some of those parts. Again, availability is an issue for some things. Uh, so far, we haven't run into too much of an issue, but we do have one thing that's on order for like two months, but we won't need it till much later, so we're okay with that. He might even have gotten the flooring materials ordered. Are you starting to get the picture of how much time he spent thinking and thinking and calculating and thinking and calculating some more in order to accomplish this monumental task of just moving from one area to the next and calculating how much uh, material that he needs to accomplish a given tax, a task. The plumbing is going to be contracted out, and we shall see what the estimates are for that bit of work. I don't know what his plans are about whether the commercial kitchen will be plumbed and outfitted at this time. We're just ready to get this project completed and to get started selling our cheese to the public. We really only need the milking parlor and milk room and the cheese make room and we'll be ready to go. The bathroom, the 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 other cheese cave and the commercial kitchen can come along later. But we just started the fifth year of construction. And honestly, I can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel. We're going to get there. All right, so that's all the homestead updates that I have for you today. There'll be lots more later, but let's follow up on starting or, or producing your own food. And we're starting with gardening, and I talked about soil a little bit uh, last week. And now I want to talk about starting plants indoors. Um, so on the last podcast, I talked about getting the soil ready and it having to improve over the years so that you're growing your crops there and it's going to take you a little while to get that soil up and going. And I want to touch on what it takes to start plants indoors as the next step. And then after that, of course, it's going to be planting seeds directly out in the garden and transplanting. So we'll get to that later. So the goal with your plants indoors is to get them large enough and healthy enough to plant out in the garden when the ground temperature has reached the proper level. And the first step is calculating when to start them. Some plants require six weeks of growth, others eight weeks or more. For instance, tomatoes and peppers are on the eight weeks side of that calculation. Summer squash and melons, they're hanging around closer to the six weeks mark. Uh, if you wanted to venture into celery, that may require as many as 12 weeks of indoor growth, along with repotting in between, and so on. So uh, perhaps I'll save that one for you until after you have a year or two of success with the other plants. I do not recommend getting to the point of growing your own uh, celery until you've got some other indoor plants under your belt. 
but you will want to at some point grow some celery it's not commonly grown but it is so good that tasteless stuff purchased from your local grocery store will fall by the wayside wayside uh, once you know how to grow your own now to recap read the directions on uh, read the description sorry on what you plan to grow They'll be on the seed packets. They will clearly state how many weeks ahead of last frost date to start your plants. Or uh, they, it might come in terms of you're going to plant it like two weeks after your your uh, first frost date. Or sorry, your your last frost date uh, in, the, in the spring. And maybe you'll plant two weeks after that, like for tomatoes. So all of that is, the last frost date is determined by where you live in the U.S. It's divided into zones, with zone 1 being the farthest north, and then zone 8 and 9 are way down in Florida. Here in southwestern Virginia, we are in zone 7A, and just a few miles from us, also southwestern Virginia, the elevation is significantly higher. And those living up the mountain are firmly in zone 6. And for zone 7, the last frost date is uh, April 15th or so. And for zone 6, I believe it's all the way to May 1st. I'm not sure on that as it is not my zone. So look up USD planting zones to find out where you fall in the scheme of things. And it'll tell you when your your uh, last frost date is. So And once you have your USDA zone identified, then you actually are going to have your first and your last frost dates. Your first frost dates would be for in the fall when, it, when that frost is going to hit your plants. Now, also, let me be clear on this. When they say last and or first frost dates, what they are referring to is the approximate date when the chance of frost is 50%. So you can have a late frost after the official date, which can be devastating to whatever you've already planted outside. And the same for first frost date in the fall, you can have plants still out in the garden that you hope to harvest before they get hit with the frost. And it can come earlier than ex expected and ruin your fall harvest. But you're at that 50% chance. Most people use that as, as a pretty solid date. So now that you have all that straight, right, you're going to count back from your last frost date the number of weeks recommended to grow your indoor seedlings. Um, I usually transplant plant my tomatoes out into the garden actually two weeks after the expected last frost date. So I'm going to go back from that date. That's around the first week of May. That, I'm going to go back from there for my tomatoes. I count back eight weeks from the first of May, and that will be when I want my tomato plants to be started. Check your package instructions. No matter the plant, it is generally clearly stated when is the best time to plant it outside. How many weeks to grow the plants indoors prior to transplanting? planting outside so like tomatoes it might say two weeks after last frost or when the soil reaches x temperature i just usually give it a couple of weeks after last frost and hope that the soil is that warm and it's, it use it's worked out for me so far um, and then you count back from that date uh, and post on locals if you have more questions on this and i'll see if i can answer your questions now, as far as starting your seeds, let, let's get into that. So you're going to purchase good organic seed starting mix. There are all kinds of bags of potty mix and planting mix and garden soil and so on at your local big box stores. Uh, you've got uh, Walmart and Target, Lowe's and uh, what's the other one? Home Depot and all kinds of these big box stores are going to have these seed starting supplies. You may find some in your local uh, stores as well, so you want to purchase for them if you possibly can. But you are looking specifically for seed starting mix. Jiffy and miracle Grow are popular organic brands for these uh, items. There are others. Just make sure it is seed starting mix. So now you're going to decide, or you have already decided, how many tomato, pepper, lettuce, squash, etc. plants that you want to plant, plan on growing in your garden. And then I try to start that many seeds for each item plus 25%, sometimes more. So if I want four tomato plants, I start five or maybe six. It's nature. Not all seeds will sprout. And some sprouts, uh, plants, may be obviously weak. And strong plants are important. Once you know how many of each plant you intend to start from seed, you're going to have a better idea of how many containers that you need. Now, for planting containers, I use the six-cell seed starting trays. They're about an inch and a half square, I think. 
inch to an inch and a half, maybe inch and a quarter square. And they're about two inches deep. And there's six of them, obviously, to a, a, a container. And it's, uh, it's beneficial to also have purchased the plant trays that hold the containers. And you'll see these when you go to Walmart and so on where they're selling these plants. And they've got these trays and they've got these containers inside those trays. That's what you're looking for. Uh, and they all come in standard sizes. The standard tray is going to hold 12 of those six cell containers. That's 72 plants in one tray. Uh, so you may only need one tray for all of the stuff that you plan to grow ahead. You may need more, but again, go back and figure out how many plants that you need that you want to plant in the garden and then add 25% or more to that. Uh, let's see. Now, there are other pot sizes of pots you can buy, but this is my choice for starting from seed. Once the seeds have reached a, a larger size, then I transplant them into two inch by two inch containers. And, and each of the standard size trays, again, will hold these perfectly, but it will hold 32 of the two inch by two inch pots. So now I've doubled my space because now I can hold... Um, it would take me two of those trays to hold 64 plants. Uh, let's see. Now those uh, plant trays come with a plastic cover. Uh, so you'll, if they don't come with it, you, you'll want to purchase them separately. You need that plastic cover. Now let's talk about filling up your, your containers. You have a couple of choices about filling your containers. There's the option to fill each cell with dry mix and then add water. Or another option is to wet the seed starting mix first and then fill the cells with a damp soil. I'm going to leave that choice to you. I like to fill it dry and add water after. I just found the damp soil was sticking to my hands and getting everywhere and, and it was just easier for me to fill with dry and clean up with the dry. It is har harder to get, if you fill them with dry, it is harder to get it to the proper wetness. So, but I'll leave that to you which way you want to do that. Wet it before you put it in the cells or after. In either, in either case, you're going to give yourself time to do it right. It takes some time for that seed starting mix to absorb the water. It doesn't just suck it up right away. And you want it just damp enough to kind of clump together, but you don't want it soggy at all. Uh, so when wetting it ahead of time, don't get in a hurry. Add a good amount of water. Wait for it to incorporate fully before adding more. And then you keep it up until you've reached the consistency you desire. Just make sure that you wait long enough for it, all that water to be good and absorbed before you add more water. Now, if you're using my method and you're adding water after the fact, I use a two-step method. I wet it from the top and then I add water to the tray. It's dry and so when you wet it from the top, it has a tendency to float out. So I like to, I use my little sprayer uh, and uh, it's a sprayer mister. So I can kind of wet it down on top so it won't float away. And uh, so you want to get good at adding water to the tray though. So once you've kind of dampened down the top of it, I put the water into the bottom and then it may take two or three hours for it to suck that water up. And then I go and I, I test, is it, is it damp at the top? And that tells me whether I need to maybe put a little bit more on the top. And uh, if there's still water in the bottom of the tray and it's damp, then I'm going to pour that extra water out of the tray. Let's see. Uh, a little bit more on that adding water to the tray because that's going to be, that's my preferred method of watering. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Now, planting the seeds. The, once you've got the soil in the containers and it's dampened to your satisfaction, you're ready to add the seeds. Many seeds are very tiny and it's hard to get just one or two in the cell. So don't worry about it. If you have several that sprout, you can thin them out by pulling the weakest sprouts out and focusing on the strongest one for each cell. You let them grow up a little bit and then you'll take out the extra ones. You only want one plant per cell, two at the most. And tiny seeds can be laid right on the surface and then you sprinkle with just a little dry soil and then with a spray mister you can kind of dampen it on top and you're dampening the soil and dampening the seed as well. Uh, now, 
uh, I plant larger seeds by making an indentation in the seed mix with a pencil or a small stick. And then I put the seed in the little hole and then kind of gently move the damp, kind of pinch it together, move that dampened soil over the seed. <clears throat> the depth that you plant them, there's kind of a rule of thumb, uh, and it says on the seed packet as well, but kind of a rule of thumb is that seeds are planted at the depth equal to their diameter. So lettuce seeds are tiny little things, and we just, I just lay those on top of the soil. Again, sprinkle just a little soil on top and then dampen it a little bit. Um, but I use the pencil idea for tomatoes and peppers. Cilantro is planted a little deeper as the seed is even larger than the tomato seed and each seed has just enough energy within it to push above the soil and begin to get sunlight so if it's planted too deep it will run out of energy before reaching the surface and if planted too shallow its roots may not get a good grip on the soil which makes a weak plant so planting too deep has always been a bigger problem for me i can always add soil if a seed sprouts on the surface i can put some dirt up around it and kind of support it and get it to root a little bit better all right now once you've got all your precious seeds nestled into the potting mix you'll want to cover that tray with the plastic cover this keeps the moisture high and now we wait i've had seeds sprout within days that the package said would take seven to ten days but two three days and they're sprouting it, you just never know check daily some seeds require two weeks or more to sprout do not give up too early if it's a late sprouting seed most things will sprout within a week to 10 days but just note on the package if you're not getting that week to 10 days maybe it's a, it takes a long time and once the seeds sprout take that plastic cover off you want to let the air circulate molds can kill off your seedlings overnight they're very very fragile in the beginning so let that air circulate <clears throat> once they're up above the the soil now they'll once they get their first set of real leaves it's time to fertilize there's, there's usually a pair of initial leaves when they when the seed first sprouts they're generally kind of roundish and then after a day or two, a second set of leaves are going to sprout, and those are going to be usually shaped differently. Uh, they're more like uh, they're more in line with like a full-grown leaf of the plant, so a long, skinny one, uh, for sometimes for peppers, the little ruffled edge ones for the tomatoes. Um, so just look for leaves three and four coming up out of the center. You'll see what I mean. Now, once you see those next leaves come out it's time to fertilize and i use fish emulsion in a spray mister my particular uh, model of mister has uh, a stream setting and so i can get a stream instead of a, a spray uh, and so i mix up the fish emulsion and then i spray right at the base of the stem just a stream one or two squirts is plenty uh, fertilization is important at this stage but you don't need a lot of it just don't leave it out you really need that fertilizer at this stage now you're cooking keep the lights on your plants 12 to 14 hours you'll need one of those timers for your lights um, water about once per week don't let the seed starting mix completely dry out but don't make it too wet remember the mold i like to water from the bottom also as it encourages the roots to reach down for the water and if it gets a little too moist on the bottom it's usually okay more towards the top um, it's also easier than trying to spray mist the uh, it's, it's easier than trying to spray mist the delicate seedlings where when they first sprout because it's really easy just to drown them with even the smallest of squirts you, you think that mister is really light but it'll just push those plants right over so i like watering from the bottom uh, again it encourages the roots to reach down to the water okay that will get you started i'm going to put together a more comprehensive list of materials and such to help with the planting stages as this was more focused on the actual planting but as i kind of glossed over it, you've got all kinds of equipment and things that you're going to need to make it work well you're going to find that information at peacefulheartfarm.locals.com. Come on over and check it out.
And we're done for this podcast. I still have lots more updates on the homestead to share, and I hope you enjoyed the update on the Livestock Guardian Dogs. I never thought I would love dogs so much, but I truly enjoy these wonderful animals. I was so worried that I would be a really bad dog owner, not knowing anything about raising dogs. And as per our usual, we read a lot and asked lots of questions and found that it was not as hard as I thought. Oh, for sure, there are challenges we're facing, but I feel up to the task. And the vet has helped tremendously. I can always ask the expert if I ever have any doubts. It's not quite time to get started with the garden yet, and I hope this podcast topic is just in time to get you in the mood for the planning parts We and getting ready for the plant starts. We will start ours around the end of March, perhaps a little earlier. We shall see. It all depends on what I decide on for the garden this year and how early... It needs to be planted before, uh, before the, uh, before it gets planted out in the garden. I hope you'll check out our locals page again. That's peacefulheartfarm.locals.com. You can support us there either financially or just by visiting us and sharing your, our sharing this post on your social media pages. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on your favorite platform. And remember to give us a five-star rating and a review. Reviews are important to expand our reach. And if you like this content and you want to help out the show, the absolute best way you can do that is to share it with any friends or family who might be interested in this type of content. Let them know about the Peaceful Heart Farmcast. Thank you so much for stopping by the homestead. And until next time, may God fill your life with grace and peace.